There we go. And as um, as is the new usual um, for our community chats, I'm going to just plug some things that are happening at Reclaim. We've got actually kind of a lot of stuff going on right now. So um, as a reminder, community.reclaimhosting.com, kind of your one stop um, for pretty much everything we're doing right now. But um, I'm going to start right away with the uh, EdTech button here. We've got a handful of things up on the event calendar. So, of course, community chat today. Um, we've got a, uh, a lot of stuff centered around OER um, happening. So on Friday, we've got a little preview. We have some folks that are going to be presenting at OER, and they're going to be talking about their session. And then next week, we will be joined live from OER by those same people. Um, that and so we're really excited to be able to participate in OER 24 and yeah, I'm gonna highlight the cool stuff that's happening there. Um, next Tuesday we have a mystery stream. Um, it's uh, next Tuesday at uh, one Eastern, um, and there will be a recording of it after. But yeah, we got something we're excited to share with everybody, and so you should consider tuning in. It's gonna be fun. Um, and then. Uh, Coming up in April, we have a uh, flex course. So about midway through April, we're starting it. We're going to be doing one on ghost newsletters. We've done this before uh, about a year and a half ago now. Um, but we figured it was time to revisit because there are um, there <laughs> newsletters is, is a constant in somewhat right now, I would say. Uh, I was going to say somewhat evergreen right now, but that's that's con contradictory. I'm going to say usually uh, a, a, a topic of interest around here. And um, there's a lot of things that Ghost has been doing um, since uh, last time we ran the Flex course. So we, we think it's time to kind of dust that off and remake it. Um, so that's what we're doing in April. Um, and so you can check that out um, on the event calendar. You can RSVP to... Uh, uh, get stay in the loop on email updates and things as, as we get launching with that. Um, but of course, as always, you can go um, here and check out uh, recent streams we've done. We've had a couple different Reclaim Todays recently um, that are definitely uh, worth checking out. We've actually had a lot of guests in general between streams and Reclaim Todays recently, so it's been really cool. Um, so I highly recommend checking that out. We had uh, conversations with uh, Anne Marie Scott and uh, Suzanne Norman and um, and Michael Branson Smith and Paul Bond just all recently. So really great. Um, so that's what's coming up. But um, today we're kind of here to talk about uh, ed tech origin stories. Um, this is something I always like hearing about listening to people kind of share how they got into a particular field. I mean, really in general, but I think particularly in the ed tech space, um, because there's not a lot of singular clear paths that people find themselves, at least it seems to me that people find themselves doing this work. A lot of, it feels like we're a industry of vagabonds <laughs> who arrive here via different different methods and i guess it's not again completely unique to you know jobs like this but um it's interesting to me and i think especially because before this i was a teacher and there is kind of just like one path to do that so it's so weird to me uh in kind of a great way so um we have talked about this kind of thing before of course a, a little bit um and actually, um, not in a community chat, but but in you know reclaim today's and streams like that, the, the topic comes up. Um, but I will also point out that um, over the last summer, um, you know, and at reclaim open, the documentary that came out of that conference did also kind of touch on this stuff. And it's been something that I've been wanting to return to kind of since then. Of like, we should really do a community chat, encourage people to kind of share their their stories, what whatever they want to share around that. Um, because I think um, it, it's important because I do, I do find people that, you know, will say like, how, you know, how, how can I learn how to work in the education space with technology, helping teachers and, um, and students. And um, I don't always have, personally always have very good answers um, or at least, at least my experience doesn't really lead to one. So I'm kind of always, um, 
excited to listen to how other people um, found themselves doing this work. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the format. Um, I'm going to ask folks to share um, and and hopefully have an interesting discussion around it. And so the fun I, part is someone gets to go first. <laughs> so I will say I I discovered uh, ed tech through this tool called ChatGPT, and it changed my life. <laughs> In, in fact, I don't think EdTech started before <laughs> a tool called ChatGPT started, or at least Udacity, or something like that. I don't know what. I'm reading a definition here that says, as a large language model, I cannot answer questions about vocation and calling. Um, <laughs> that's my understanding of educational technology. Um, so, Jim, I thought you were start with Slideshow Pro. <laughs> I'll never live that tool down. <laughs> <laughs> ever mm -hmm. i love origin stories i will i will share a quick one and then and it's funny because lauren would always joke with me and said oh i had no idea you went to school at cuny because <laughs> that's all it never comes talk up about. yeah <laughs> exactly so she she would make fun of me but i actually think it's a cool story not just because of my relationship to it, but because of what the City University of New York, I was a grad student there, what they had built. They had built this kind of fledgling program, a couple of professors at the grad center, um, in particular, Steve Breyer, and um, why am I forgetting his name? It will come back to me. Um, he was he ran ed tech at um, George Adi uh, at CUNY. They basically said, you know what, we're going to have this new program where we have instructional technology fellows who are grad students in various disciplines who actually work with students and faculty to integrate. At that point, it was like 2004. So you got a Mac, which is why people did it. You got this kind of little iOS 9, almost iOS 10 Mac, and you're like, oh my God, I have a computer now. Um, but then the other thing was you would work with one or two faculty over a semester and deal with various things like that was when I first started installing WordPress and MediaWiki. And I was one of like 20 uh, faculty uh, ITFs. And we were at like oh, 20 different schools. And we would come together weekly and talk about what we were doing. And that was the model. I, like I did that for a year. And then I went to UMW and then had a very similar model where we were all at different you know, programs and, and buildings, but then we would come together weekly and talk about what we did. But I just really liked that because I had no, I was going to school for, you know, American Lit. I had no real idea, but after a year of doing the ITF, I got a job. You know, it was that weird moment when if you knew anything about like open source software and you knew what Firefox was, you could get a job. Like that was kind of a strange time. And that's my origin story is City University of New York kind of um, a, a off, not a kind of like a graduate program to get a computer that turned into a career, um, which is a, a super strange thing. Not what I thought I would ever be doing, but then once I started doing it, um, I kind of fell in love with it. Do you know how to install a WordPress plugin was one of the, wow, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's one of the questions. Um, yeah, I, I I find that like so like the the it feels to me like what kind of the core of what you're saying, Jim, like is that you know like this this really cool program kind of created a situation where you know you could learn about this stuff and grow into it. And it feels to me like that is often at the core of these things, is like you have a person who is trying to create a environment that can foster sort of innovation, innovation, learning around technology and what it can mean in a school environment of at whatever level, really. Um, and it's so hard to build those things. Like I, 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 I like respect the heck out of that work because it, you know, it, it requires funding, it requires time, it requires expertise, it requires people to believe in what you're trying to build and it all has to go correctly, you know?
Um, so I can I can share. Uh, my, I I don't know. If my mine is like um, not really maybe particularly interesting, but like so, <laughs> I I have always been even as like a kid like really into like computers and computing in certain ways, and. Uh, the other thing I've always been into is music and, and um, well, I shouldn't say always, but for a long time. So like coming out of high school, I thought I wanted to teach music. And my second thing was like maybe computer science. I didn't know. And then I decided I probably didn't want to be a programmer basically, or that didn't seem like something I wanted to pursue. So I went, got my undergrad in music education, of course, worked for the IT department the whole time. Um, and I, I went to uh, St. Norbert College. And then I taught band for a year and decided I didn't want to continue doing that. <laughs> um, and um, I think for most K-12 teachers, their first year teaching is very difficult. So I, mine, not really any exception. Um, my wife is also a choir teacher and she's a year older than me. So she went through this the year before I did. And um, in some ways, obviously she was really helpful but in some ways also it was like a, a comparison point for me for for me to like watch what she felt good at and confident in and what I did not feel good at and confident in and what would stress about and I'd be like yeah I need to teach this tomorrow and I want to do this this and that and and you know I'd be like writing up this huge long lesson plan thing at like 9 p.m the night before and she's like why are you writing all this like don't you know what you're going to do? And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, and, and she's like, well, you know, th I don't know that I would have lesson planned that. That just feels natural to me. I was like, it doesn't feel natural to me. Um, and um, basically near the end of the year, there was an opening in IT and I just at St. Norbert College working with would have been my former boss when I was a student. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to apply for it because I really don't like what I'm doing at this moment. Um, I like working with students. I like teaching, but just the reality of this is not is grinding me down. And so I'm going to apply for that, see if I like it, and I can always return. And I just never did. <laughs> um, and uh, it was I feel really fortunate that I went to go work at a at a college because I got to then transition from sort of general IT to specifically the academic technology department and work with some really amazing people who taught me a lot. And I got to use some of the things I understood and knew about teaching to kind of make conversations with faculty feel more useful to them. Um, and and now I'm here at Reclaim. So that that was kind of I kind of like fell backwards into it. Um, and I'm really glad I did because if I would have majored in something else, I probably wouldn't have. I probably would have gone and done something else, or I don't know. You know who knows? But that's sort of. Um, that was sort of um, how I kind of fell into it. It's nice. It's education, technology. It's peanut butter. Marriage of peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> exactly. It's perfect for you. Well, interestingly, I did the K-12 thing, but maybe accidentally. So I started off as a history major, was going to go to law school, then delivered some sandwiches to the law school and decided I didn't like them as people. And so that's how I changed my mind about law school. Very well. That seems like a pretty good way to do it and maybe inexpensive way to find yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wait a minute, I hate these people. Um, and so uh, I did uh, academic support for student athletes and ended up learning how to make websites and things like that as I was doing that back in the day. A little bit of HTML, some Dreamweaver, uh, maybe even front page at different times. And that got me a little bit of technology. Uh, and then I got sick of that job for a variety of reasons and got an emergency certification to teach alternative middle school um, for sixth graders in a place that had one-to-one -one laptops. So in absolute desperation to keep them from rioting every day. I tried to use the computers in ways that would like actually get them entertained. I made like weird websites for the class with like pit bulls and all sorts of strange things on them. You know, a James Bond theme, I think one year. 
Um, and that's kind of what led me down this path. Yeah, some bizarre videos where I dressed as a ninja and did instructions later on. Um, you know, like I did all sorts of really, really odd things. But then that got me into more and different types of technology. Because unlike Taylor, I guess, like I hated computers for a good chunk of my life. Like found them mainly really angering and uh, an impediment to most of the things I wanted to do. Never really played video games, you know, I'm like Jim, perhaps, uh, you know, don't have a nostalgic yearn for arcades, no interest. <laughs> um, so, you know, like that stuff just wound around in lots of different ways. So, I mean, the reason I, I mention it to people sometimes is like, you know, like you don't have to start from the ground to, to get to different places, you know, and Jim and I did presentations on hating programming and swearing we'd never learn. Um, and now I'm like, oh, uh, like, you know, whoops, I, I did accidentally learn some programming somewhere along the way. Um, I'll blame Alan for that, maybe. Um, but you know it's just it's just interesting how different things can happen in really abstract ways throughout your life that lead you down these things not basically because of a passion for computers or anything on my end or even technology but i like to do things that amuse me um and i'm particular about how things work so that led me farther and farther down these rabbit holes I relate to that. So recently my like being like caring about and something that you can create and what it looks like. I mean, for me, I have like not a visual design bone in my body. So that means like how things might work um, for me. And uh, like pretty recently, my parents sent me a picture. I'm, I can't find it. I'm trying to dig it up, but of something that they kept when I made I made when I was like they figure like six or seven, and I guess I always had a, a love for automation because I drew on a piece of cardboard a universal remote, like literally, like <laughs> like literally it says remote control, of course spelled wrong, for anything. And it has like, it's like a smart home thing. Like it's like lights and like, it, there's like a TV area and stuff. And I was like, huh, I guess I've always kind of liked the idea of automating things. <laughs> so. I can maybe go next. Um, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, because it feels like, I don't know, I, 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 I was thinking through how I sort of got to reclaim because that's kind of, my edtech journey feels very short um, compared to uh, some of what you guys have been saying. But uh, basically back when I was uh, in undergrad, I was studying uh, cinema and media studies, film uh, so there was a, there was a practical element and there was a theory element. And one of the theory classes that was taught by a visiting professor was called digital cinema cultures. And I went, that sounds awesome. I'm going to take that. And, um, it was, it was really cool. It was, uh, a look at different ways that, uh, digital media is used to create, uh, more experimental narratives or the ways that, um, we use like the idea of the digital to sort of the, the thing I'm thinking about uh, is, is there's a, a movie called Hardcore Henry that is shot on a GoPro and it's all first person and it looks like a first person shooter video game. So bringing in the aspect of, oh, this is a video game into what is actually a movie. Um, so crossing the streams on what we think of as different types of media. Um, which was just really interesting. And it got me thinking about how we use technology to talk to people um, and how do we how we talk to people about technology. And then the same uh, professor, the next term ran a course called Video Games and Identity, which was about political messaging and activism um, and political movements around video games. Uh, and that was really cool. And then I didn't do anything with it for like a year and a half. 
And then uh, I was looking at student job work positions, student jobs for my senior year. And I saw that there was a digital scholarship program, uh, internship program that had a specific position open for the ethics intern. And I went, all right, uh, I can't do the front end programming or the back end programming ones, but I could do that. Uh, and I applied for that and got it and it was great. Uh, and it was a ton of research. Um, and so uh, a lot of it was uh, every week I would pick or be given a topic and uh, something timely or relevant. Uh, like that was around the time of the 2020 primaries, there was uh, those uh, concerns about people hacking the Iowa uh, electronic ballot counters, um, things like that. Uh, doing research write-ups, deliver those to my supervisors, um, researching GDPR, uh, California Consumer Privacy Act, uh, what the school's responsibilities were to people in Europe, um, international students in America versus American students studying abroad, things like that. Uh, and that was awesome. And then a lot of, uh, uh, or to some degree, working with professors who were trying to think through their digital projects, but maybe hadn't had a great background in organizing a digital project versus uh, a physical one, or just this is a written research project versus how do you make use of digital media to convey what you're trying to talk about. And then I graduated in 2020, and there was a huge demand for jobs in academic technology for some reason um, in June of 2020. <laughs> um, so Carleton's academic technology department, which was where my supervisor worked, uh, opened up uh, one year like, hey, you just graduated and you know things. Do you want to please help us talk to faculty jobs? Uh, and my supervisor said I should apply for that, and I did. And that was the same summer Carleton got Domain of One's Own. And the person who worked with Carleton to get that uh, set up left a month after I started. So that became my job. Um, and uh, that was the rest of my year was helping faculty figure out how to get websites and then what to do with them. Um, and working a bit with the internship program and project management questions, but mostly Domain of One's Own. And then my contract ended and Reclaim was hiring and now I'm here. You know what's wild about that pilot is A, you got hired and didn't realize this as an ed tech at the height or beginning of COVID. I, I hadn't realized that. That's crazy. And we knew you through the very articulate tickets you would put in to try and understand the main of one's own. So when you applied, we're like, yeah, we're no pilot. <laughs> That's great because I was always worried about those tickets because a lot of it was going, hey, so I got like 45 minutes of explanation of what cPanel was as my training. So what do I do? <laughs> uh you played it very well, I have to say. Just like your emails now, you're a professional. Well, I I appreciate that. Um, yeah. That was also Carlton was uh, closing down their old multi-site, which was suffering from a lot of the problems that old multi-sites had. So we were doing a lot of manually migrating individual WordPress sites onto cPanel. Um, so that was also how I spent like the first four months of that job. So now I know a lot about the, that was a crash course in how to fully build a WordPress site instead of just put blog posts onto one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, 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 Tom just put something in the chat about um, growth from suffering. Uh, I feel very qualified to advise people on what not to do with WordPress multi-sites now. <laughs> um, but. I'd be happy to take a turn. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds good. Um, 
I don't know if I like ed tech as much as I like working with great people and being in higher ed. Uh, they were just things that, uh, like over time, one of, you know, I've, I've come to understand my skill set is not necessarily being the person that does the great thing, but the person that helps other people do the great thing and feel totally comfortable <laughs> in that role, you know? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I've had a, uh, uh, and, and one, you know, one of the things about, uh, a, a, a job is you can look at it like a job and not your whole life. Um, which I think I probably fall more on that side. So the, the things that I need to get out of it are more an enjoyment of the day to day. And that really does come from the kinds of things you get to do and the people that you get to do it with, right? So I feel pretty fortunate for the most part. I've had tons of both, right? So uh, things that I like to do and, and great people to work with. And that kind of has con continues today. So I still sit here and do this, right? Um, uh, that is that's not always the case for everybody um that's not always the case in i, I mean even like this you know that more scrutiny on higher ed and what is it good for these days and what the general world thinks about higher ed is i think less than it used to be um but you know all the more reason why we have to keep going forward and because you know, curiosity and learning and service, uh, it's all just been kind of what I get out of this job because I came to it all over the place too, right? I started with an associate's degree in drafting. And then I got a, uh, another, went to another, another degree in engineering where I didn't academically make a good progress. And then I went and got a degree in communications where I did video production and that was great. I liked doing that and ended up getting my first job for Marymount University where I did my communications degree and made videos of HR scenarios for students for, you know, six months of a year. So, uh, and then that kind of got me into like, oh, I like TV and I did that as a freelancer for a, you know, a year. And then it was like, uh, um, then ended up in Western Pennsylvania in Slippery Rock where there weren't great opportunities at the time I was there and managed a shoe store, which Jim knows all the shoe store stories, right? Did that for a while. Then I went and got a master's in education in the University of Georgia. And then I got a job at Mary Wash and I've just been here since then. And then, oh, I recently just became a Mary Wash alumni because I finished my historic preservation bachelor of liberal studies here because we could take classes for free right so um uh but uh yeah so it's it's you know i don't know if i i can say i've been like attracted or sucked into any particular technology other than i like technology in general one thing i really do like is i get to work on all of the teaching and learning spaces here so I've come full circle back to like where I liked the architecture and all those kind of things. So uh, I still get to work on that. I thought it was pretty cool, Jerry, when, you know, you, Martha, and pretty much everybody in the team but me was working on the new building that you all are in now, um, the Hurley Convergence Center. Like that was, I mean, you, you all like were able to kind of build out a space that, you know, is pretty radical and cool. And how many people get that opportunity? And you have been, you were into spaces from the beginning. So that's, that's a cool like connection with now you getting your degree in historic preservation, which is all about spaces, both long, old and new, right? And it's cool. funny we're having a 10 year it's the 10th year anniversary of the building this fall 
and what? the 10th year anniversary of the DKC, the Digital Knowledge Center here. So we're planning some events and, uh, you know, an exhibition in the in the digital gallery and all kinds of fun things to do. So. 10 years. That's crazy to me, actually, when I think about that, because I was only in that building for a year. That's really wild. Cool. <laughs> Uh, I'd be glad to talk. I guess we'll get all the Mary Washington people out of the way. <laughs> uh, and I feel like I got to share some of the set Reclaim Open um, in terms of like I too taught, I was a history undergrad, uh, but I was a student aide DTLT. So like all I wanted to do was come back and work with fun people. I was like, I just want to work at Mary Washington so I can work with amazing people. And ultimately I got a job in the library um, and through a series of unfortunate events, uh, everybody in DCOT left. And so I was well positioned uh, to slide in uh, and uh, just kind of be here because of all the past experiences I've had. Um, and, you know, just keeping, I was always, even when I wasn't in those spaces, like professionally, I was always in the conversation still. I never like left those kinds of, the, that kind of world. Like I would still come back to faculty academy after I graduated. And, it's always, you know, reading people's blogs when they still blogged. Um, some people never left. Uh, so, yeah. And, you know, I'm at this point in about to wrap up grad school. And, you know, because Tom mentioned he he got a degree. I'm kind of in a similar position where I'm like, I kind of need an advanced degree in order to do other things at, in higher ed. But I have found, luckily, I was, you know, I was considering doing something like instructional technology. Because I was just like, well, like. I got to figure it out. I wasn't super excited about that because I feel like maybe if you come from this particular vein, some people like, you know, I don't really I find problems with this and a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, but I found, uh, oh, Jerry found a program. Uh, it's a design think uh, MFA in design thinking through Radford. And I was like, this feels like this will be fun. And we'll kind of check that box that the institution kind of, you know, looks for. Um, Cause I, I could look around at everybody else in the field with me and be like, well, nobody has a degree that is like in the field. Like it clearly doesn't matter. <laughs> like just go do a thing that excites you. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of kind of my story. Just like, I've always kind of like you Taylor, like always interested, love technology. It was always something background to what I was doing and uh, just never left. You kind of got a BA in DTLT, didn't you? <laughs> Absolutely. I probably spent more time in DTLT than I did in class, I'll be honest. <laughs> that was awesome. I loved it. All right. Old stories. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I actually took a programming class in high school. Uh, we used punch cards. <laughs> we had to get on a bus to go to a different school, uh, but I liked it. And when I went to university, I didn't know what to take. And um, my sister had gone into computer science and it's like, oh, well you get a job. And I went to University of Delaware and did a year of it and I hated it. <laughs> I hated computer science. I saw my future being in some closed warehouse of programmers. And uh, oh, skipping, I, I went and flipped the catalog and I picked geology <laughs> and got my undergrad and that's my training. Um, but I just needed to take, I suffered through one more class that I don't even understand that I got a minor in computer science. Um, and then I went to grad school at, to at Arizona State University. So it's been so long I forgot where I went. and. Um, you know, I was a geology grad student. That's what I, I love doing that stuff. And they saw I had this minor in computer science and they had just gotten this lab full of little Mac pluses and said, oh, do you want a TA running this stuff? And I was like, yeah, why not? Uh, and I just figured some stuff out and helped other grad students, you know, use it for writing and uh, started writing some programming to teach a couple things. And all of a sudden I kind of liked using computers because I was doing something with it. 
And uh, later on, just cutting it short, I decided I didn't want to be a, a geologist. And I, I went to look for jobs and uh, found one at the Maricopa Community Colleges. I was like totally unqualified for, but they took a chance and they hired me and uh, everything there uh, was just learning stuff um, off the internet as I went. And uh, one thing led to another and the web came out. <laughs> People were blogging. I met Jim Groom and uh, Jerry and Shannon there. I spent some time at, at Mary Wash. Um, and it's just been one lucky ride. I've never had a real job. I mean, I've always been in education, so I've never worked for a, a profit um, and don't know anything about a bottom line. Uh, and so I, I think I will stay there. <laughs> uh, but it's always been fun. Uh, uh, mainly because of the people. Like, yeah. Tom and I are having a conversation through blog comments. <laughs> We're not even emailing. <laughs> it's great. I know there was a time, Alan, when we, um, I think it was in Vancouver, and we were sharing a room, and you had just, you just run a marathon, and I knew that because you had the I Hate Running blog running for years but then you also took me for a trip through all of the old maricopa sites that you had built and then archived and i am blown away by your archive of your old html work and i think it's macromedia director stuff yeah that's just yeah. awesome i think i think it's because when i left um uh, I just, for some reason, I said, I, I want to take all my files because I had them all on my computer. And um, I actually still have that little hard drive I, I stole from Maricopa. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, like this little, I can't remember the brand name, but it was like a 10 gig. It was huge. It was 10 gigabytes. Um, and I just have all the HTML. And I um, there's one, one website I wish I forgot to export the MySQL and I, I would have liked to rebuild it, but without the database. Yeah. So, but yeah, thank you, Jim. Yeah. Old that's stuff, a, anyhow. But that's a rich archive, though, of like the web at that moment. You know what I mean? And you've blogged all this, but like, I love that stuff. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to bore people with the old stuff. And it's not like, like nostalgic for it, but that's what we lived through. And, and, um, you know, and, I love that everybody here had so many like different paths in and, and um, yeah, I remember working with some ed tech grad students from, from ASU. They, they came in to do some mentorships and it's like, they didn't know anything. Like, I don't know what they're teaching over there, but they didn't, they couldn't do anything. They didn't know how to think creatively. No, I'm being a little bit judgmental, but I, I always saw by, um, by going through a focus on a discipline, like in a subject area, was really almost a better guide than learning uh, a bunch of like because the, the tech stuff you can pick up and the tech stuff is like easy to find out if you're doing wrong that's my favorite thing about technology is it just stops working if you break it <laughs> <laughs> like instantly and immediately yeah <laughs> and i know that frustrates a lot of people but like i find that useful feedback that i can act and quickly on right um and um like, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I kind of agree with that. Like, I feel like I learned so much by just like understand or trying to understand what, like what teachers needed and what students wanted by talking to them <laughs> basically um, and trying things and finding out what didn't work. And like that, that, that's, I don't know. That's the work of it to me, you know? Yeah, because like sometimes, like I remember working with faculty, and they didn't know anything about technology, but they knew exactly they wanted. They knew what they wanted to experience, and sometimes they say like, "I don't know what I want to do." Like, well, let's talk about like what you, what are some of your course activities? Like, where are students like getting stuck? Like, what can we do? So, it, it's kind of you know, I'm, I'm sure all you know, of you dealing with faculty have have felt that kind of like ride from people who. Um, come in with with very good plans that you just need to implement and maybe add to and, and other times you just get to help them build it and that's that's where the magic is
Yeah, I feel like we're dancing around like what I think is always the central tension of ed tech, which is like people, the edu- like people look at people in our positions and see the technology, but forget like there's a reason education is part of that. We're not just somewhere doing setting up networks or infrastructure. Not that those things are important, but like the amount of times I just we've just been called IT. Like when we don't report up through IT here at Mary Washington, like like our interest is helping you think about these things and edu- like just think of us as experts in this particular thing uh, and we want to help you with it. Yes, it's technology, but we want to have those conversations, uh, you know, with you. We're not here just to fix your canvassing. Yes, I can help you fix your canvassing, but really I want to have a different conversation <laughs> with you uh, around like what you're trying to accomplish. I'm so glad we learned those lessons during COVID, right? <laughs> like, I'm so, I'm, I'm so glad that we finally changed. We we dialed up the meter. Um, I'm kidding. I'm just giving Amanda time. <laughs> I was going back and forth on whether or not, because I, I was so excited to listen to everyone here and your stories, but... I mean, long, long story, not as long as some of yours, I understand. I haven't been in the game as long, but for me, long story short is I um, went to State University of New York, Geneseo for English and medieval literature specifically. And I was all like, you know, I was going to Italy. I was like all about interdisciplinary stuff, Um, just seeing like, constantly trying to build connections between what an English major specifically in a meta way can do in the world. And then I got dragged into a um, creating like a digital exhibit at a museum, which was like, I had never really considered working in a museum or anything like that, but I did it. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I, there was a need and I was able to serve it with this like digital component. And then um, I kind of like let that lie for a bit and then got into OER publishing <laughs> right out of uh, graduation because SUNY was doing cool stuff with that. And they needed somebody to do like publication print design specifically. And so I was like, I've, never really done that, but I'd like to try, sure would like to try. And um, I did. And that just like, it wasn't possible for that to just exist by itself. I was, I was exposed immediately to ed tech at that point. And all of a sudden I was doing much more than just creating, you know, helping faculty across the SUNY system create um, OER texts. I was, advising them on all sorts of open tools. And then um, that led me to working in um, a digital humanities center at Geneseo where I was kind of refining that. And then I came to Reclaim, so. I love that OER is the gateway drug there. <laughs> and it, I will say it was a drug, you know, and I think it's, it's um, really kind of relevant now because OER 24 is coming up, but like, I had never felt more energized or I remember like when I first started working in that job, I I was talking to all my friends who were newly, you know, new undergrad, like newly graduated from undergraduate. And um, I was like, you know, they're all kind of slogging through what they're doing at that moment. I was like, is it weird that I absolutely love what I'm doing? (laughs) Um, And I was really, really all about it, you know, and I still, I still am, still love it. you know, all good things must come to an end uh, in terms of that. But uh, it was, it was so cool. And I feel like when you get introduced to the, the space through OER, I mean, it's, it's a certain kind of magic. I just remember being very bright eyed, bushy tailed about the whole thing. It was awesome. Yeah, because it also had a philosophy behind it, right? Like, I'm doing this openly. And you know, there's the textbook element, but uh, but that's kind of the thing that I thought was awesome when I came into ed tech at Mary Washington was like, you know, first thing to like is you have to blog. <laughs> I was like, what? And like, I was like, you know, that, and then there were other people commenting on it and there was this open dialogue. And I was like, this is awesome, right? Like I felt kind of like you. I had been like 
tortured by my PhD and by all that. I couldn't write. I, I hated writing because I wasn't a very good writer. And then someone's like, I don't care, just write. <laughs> it's like, you don't have to be good. No one, there's no level of expectation. And I was like, this is awesome. And so I had stupid stuff to talk about. But like you, I, you know, and I was later, I think I was 32 years old when I came to Mary Washington. So it was a little bit pushed on. I had been, you know, <laughs> living in New York on subsistence wages, trying to get through my PhD. But at the point when I kind of, you know, it hit me that this could be a job. I was like, you, I was like, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> It, it was kind of it was somewhat similar, like for me in the aspect, like when I was working in IT, like doing like, like help desk stuff, like answering phones, fixing broken computers, that kind of stuff. And like I at at SNC, and it's still this way that the academic technology is embedded in IT. It's just a different department. But I kind of like watch the weirdos over there doing their thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and I like obviously I, I knew like not a huge department or anything, um, but like I would you know kind of see what they're doing with like I was like this kind of just feels like IT but plus a lot of critical thinking <laughs> like that was sort of my take at the time, which felt good and attractive to me. I was like that's really cool, and then I as I kind of le like learned more about sort of the work they did. And then it's sort of like, it sort of like radicalized me to, against like, um, cause, cause it, 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 a lot of the stuff that they were talking about, like exploring OER and stuff like really connected back to things I learned about as a like pre-service teacher about like, like social justice things connected to education. And that just kind of, and I was like, all right, yeah, I really want to do that work and work on that team. And maybe they'll have an opening someday. And I'm right here, you know, <laughs> um, and that ended up working out for me. But um, and and that's very similar kind of to how I like came to reclaim too. like I, you know, I became familiar with like what Domain of One's Own was. And then we had that at St. Norbert. And it was like a similar thing to me. I was like, this is like a like a very pure expression of a lot of these things I care a lot about and like a tool to do it that's that does it in this way and meaning domain of one's own in this in this case um and so um yeah that that kind of worked out twice for me so <laughs> I think origin stories are rad though because they do tell you a lot, you know, across various fields. Like I'm, I'm fascinated coming in a little bit earlier, right? Like to hear people coming in at the point where it's like COVID or at OER, right? Or, you know, it's part of their BA seeing a group like this, which probably wouldn't have existed, you know, five years earlier in the same way. Uh, it's just trippy, you know? And then the crossing paths with people you never you never really worked alongside. Like I only worked alongside Tom because I knew his blog. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then we could talk about that story at Richmond and that's its own thing. But like, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I dig it. That was kind of an interesting place because as I joked in the beginning, like one of the questions in the interview was, can you install, like, how do you install a WordPress plugin? And I think maybe at the time you had to like drag and drop it into an FTP program. I can't remember if you got auto install at that time, you know, or whatever. Extract but, a zip file. Got to yeah, do that too. <laughs> that's, that's how I've uh, <laughs> been messing with WordPress for a long time. Um, but the other question was like some obscure question around like uh, like SQL join query statements. And I'm like, no, but I could probably Google that. You know, like there's no reason I couldn't like look up left join table or something. Um, but it was just, you know, it's always weird, like what questions people think are pertinent to the job and how different they can be technically when so much of it is more about like 
human stuff and actually having an idea worth pursuing rather than which button do you click or how do you connect to database tables in a exclusionary way and i still don't know the answer to that offhand yeah to me like the the core skill that i, I use most often and that is maybe most unique to like being a technologist in whatever field is like knowing when to step back and say like we need to talk about what the problem is not the tool <laughs> you know and how and when to do that and not that i always get it right frequently get it wrong <laughs> but like you know because there isn't necessarily right answers and but like especially with working with faculty right because you have to identify like this is a time where we need to talk about what they're trying to do or this is not a time for that <laughs> like you know they, they they don't have the time for that or don't want to or i need to get them there you know that kind of stuff i think that that is when i did have that opportunity for you know faculty who were who did have the time for that um that was probably the most impactful part for me in this whole journey was coming i mean because i wasn't a technologist when i came into this type of stuff i wasn't very interested in computers i wasn't very interested in the digital stuff i i characterized it as i got dragged into doing a digital project and that's very true um but i always um what i liked about the work and the way that i tried to kind of sell the value of liberal arts education was especially, you know, specifically English was focusing on the narrative um, of whatever it is you're doing. And I think that that is what has been so appealing to me about ed tech, especially the way that we do it at Reclaim, is that a lot of it is about the narrative. You know, what's trippy there too is, so when I was with, I did a presentation with, with Alan, where he created a, a kind of a fake Twitter account called Antisocial which was this anti kind of complaining. And I was like, I didn't really, I was like, that's weird. You could just do that. And then I went to work with Tom and he created a Twitter account called Jim quits, which we basically, cause I was leaving and he was basically like trolling me in a very fun, I creative way. Memories. <laughs> and I was like, one of the things I was trying to wrap my head around is this emergence of these new tools that gave like new ways of writing and connecting, which were powerful. Twitter was super powerful for that. And then in fact, we, we lived through a moment where an, an, a culture grew out of it, right? A way of communicating and you saw the hashtag and then you saw like it become part of a presidential race, which everyone was saying, that's just to show what you have for your breakfast. And then it's like, no, 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 no. This is actually a cultural phenomenon that we're living through. And I didn't understand any of that when Tom was, like, I just thought it was funny. Like, Jim quits. What are you doing, Jim? Or whatever. And a part of that thing with being an ed tech was kind of like living in that and trying to understand it, which I can't claim I did at all times. But it was weird just to look back after 2008, say, and then see where everything went in 2012 or 16 and how much it really became a part of the fabric of the culture. It's really trippy. Well, you remember too, we were in a lockdown in the early days of Twitter um, at the University of Richmond and we got like a picture of the person who had the what turned out to be an air gun in the library before it was live in the news and stuff like and like how all that stuff was happening in the moment super crazy you know just a weird thing to live through we got active shooter and social media a nice combo deal there tom literally like to give you a sense had to delete the Jim quits account because like not everyone understood like how the media worked and the joy of a, a group of people like they read it literally mm. and it was a kind of a very weird like moment where it was like wait 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 you won't let us install WordPress and you're making us delete this Jim quits account like I don't understand that it was such a trippy moment 
I still hope that when the Library of Congress makes the tweets a little more accessible, that I'll be able to get the old ones out. <laughs> and uh, I will definitely do something with them. And it was a lesson in context, too, because I would have people like who I knew in various other guises, like DMing me and being like, are you all right? Have you seen the Jim Quits account? And I'm like, I'm sitting next to the guy who's writing it. <laughs> it's such a weird thing. Well, maybe well, you cover yeah. Jim quits, but well, I mean that—that that to me is like if I look back at the stuff that I've done that like I care about and like, and the reason I like the job, it hits on stuff that you've all said throughout this. But it was always about like exploring a new thing, doing something that's kind of fun and a little bit out on the edge of something. And it might be something dumb like Jim quits, or non you know, non programistan or the ed tech survivalist, or whatever but like it was about having fun and pushing the boundaries of stuff as a way to show like what might be and to keep kind of going along those routes with people who who had like a spark of joy left in their soul <laughs> rather than like you know and like there's a place for doing the mundane and you have to do that as part of the job but the reason it was worth continuing was for those things where you did something bizarre with cool people that you met in just weird ways um, that often were um, facilitated by the internet in one way or another. It's not all bad. Social media, not all bad. Um, you know, like, so I don't know. That's, that's kind of what I think of origin story. It's about those people, those connections and those moments of things, be they face to face or digital. Like, I mean, Alan and I interacted for years before I met him face to face. Um, so I don't know. I think that's a good note to end on. Um, we're at uh, at time anyway, or a little bit past. But um, yeah, thanks everyone for um, for uh, sharing today. And um, I'm going to hit the stop button on the recording here and 